In Philippians chapter 2, it's a, it's a very well-known uh, passage to many people. It's uh, uh, very well uh, covered uh, in many ways. And this is where we find just, uh, uh, of course, the beginning of the chapter. Paul is exhorting the Philippians to uh, just be like-minded to one another and be, be uh, seeking the interests of others ahead of themselves. There's this idea of humility and deference to other people, seeking to put others' needs ahead of their own. And as Paul is exhorting the Philippians in that way, he gives them the example of Jesus Christ. He says, this is how I want you to behave, and I'm going to present to you the prime example of this behavior in Jesus Christ. And of course, that's where we have uh, this great Christological passage of ver- from verses 5 down through 11 of just, just the incredibleness, the incredible humility of Jesus Christ. And so let's pick it up there in verse 5. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is just a beautiful Christological passage showing the immenseness of of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And and you, you, you kind of trace just the, the, the flow of the text there, and, and it just seems like every aspect of Christ's humility is amplified every step as you go. First, he, he, didn't even, he, he uh, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but, then, but he emptied himself. Well, he didn't just empty himself, but he took on the form of a servant. And not only that, but you know, being found in the likeness of men, he humbled himself. Well, how did he humble himself? Becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross, it just, just the, the progression of that just keeps getting amplified. And then we find the great exaltation of Christ because he was willing to be humble and to suffer and to serve in that way. And we thought, I think of uh, the, the passage from Mark, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But as, as we look at that passage, and as we think about, okay, yeah, this is, it's, a, it's a great Christological passage, and, and, and it's, it's wonderful, we, we, it, it highlights the, the magnificence and the glory of Jesus Christ. But then sometimes I think we can forget about what Paul said back in verse 5, when he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He says, you should be this way. And I don't know about you, but for me sometimes I look at that and go, like, yeah, how am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to do that? Okay, this is what Jesus did. This is who Jesus is. This is the greatness of who he is. And now I'm, I'm supposed to be like, how, how am I supposed to do that? What does that look like? What does a life look like that's being modeled after Jesus in this way? And if we just keep reading, though, in the book of Philippians, we find ourselves a real world example of what it looks like to have the same mind of Jesus Christ as we seek to serve others. So let's skip down. Uh, we're gonna let's we'll skip down to verse nineteen. There's two individuals. We're gonna really uh, focus in on one, but we'll we'll, uh, we'll talk about the first one a little bit as well. But verse nineteen, uh, Paul talks uh, about Timothy. He says, "I hope." Uh, verse nineteen, "I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you, for I have no one like him." who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. So you have Timothy here, and, and Tim, Paul is excited to send Timothy because he, he trusts Timothy. He, he, he is, he's confident that Timothy is genuinely concerned for the well-being of the church. For many others seek their own interests. And again, there's that, there's that contrast if we go back to the beginning of the chapter where Paul instructs the Philippians to look out for the interests of others rather than the interests of yourself. And Paul says, here is Timothy, who is an example of not seeking his own interests, but seeking the interests of others, as Christ did when Christ humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. 
Verse 22, but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served me, in, he served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. So there's Timothy. An example, just very briefly, an example of a man who lived out practically what it means to have the same mindset of Jesus Christ. He's not seeking his own interests, but rather he's seeking to serve the interests of others. Genuinely concerned for the well-being of the church. So there's example number one. Very brief, but powerful. Then we have example number two. Epaphroditus. Okay, Epaphra who? Epaphroditus. Verse 25. I, th- I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. For I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So we have Epaphroditus, another man, who is an example of what it looked like to have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. And the man who modeled for us what it looks like to follow these footsteps. There's several things that, that I'd like us to key in on here. Notice the, the five things, the five attributes that, that Paul ascribes to Epaphroditus in verse 25. He says five things about him. He calls him my, my brother. He calls him my brother. Obviously, we know that, that when anyone comes to uh, faith in Jesus Christ, we are adopted into God's family, right? We all become uh, brothers and sisters in Jesus, it, it, in God's family, all brothers and sisters in Christ. That's, that's who we are in Christ. We become part of God's family. And Paul, I mean, he's showing, he believes that. He's like, yeah, this, this is my brother, but, but this is, but it, I think there's more to it than just that, just that surface level. Oh yeah, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think Paul is saying, oh, this, is, this is my brother, there, there's, there's an affection there. There's, there's some brotherly love there uh, between these two men. There's, Paul is not ashamed to be closely associated with this man. He's labored alongside of him, with him together. But Paul says, oh, this is my brother. We share love with, between each other. We share this, this common bond in Christ. He's my brother. He also calls him my brother. Uh, my fellow worker, my co-worker, my co-laborer. This is a man who worked alongside of Paul for the sake of the gospel. Someone who, who they were side by side in ministry. Not just brothers in Christ, but, but fellow workers laboring, toiling for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's my brother, my fellow worker. He calls him soldier. My fellow soldier. We sing songs sometimes about being in, uh, in God's army. There's several, several different songs we can point. There's the children's song, I'm in the Lord's army. Remember that song? And there's also, you know, stand up, you know, uh, you soldiers of the cross, stand up, for, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. And there's different songs that talk about this. Well, that's the way the Bible describes sometimes the, what life is like when we are Christians engaged in warfare in this world. And of course, we're not talking about physical warfare, right? We don't, we don't pick up physical weapons and, and, and fight with physical things. Rather, no, it's a spiritual warfare. There is a spiritual battle going on. Paul and Epaphroditus were engaged in a battle for souls. They were engaged in the, in the battle for souls. They were, they were seeking to see souls come to faith in Jesus Christ. But even though this battle is a spiritual battle, and there's, it's a spiritual warfare, there are many times when it has physical, real-world consequences, though, doesn't it? 
You look at Paul. When Paul's writing this letter, he's in prison for the sake of the gospel. He's in prison. He's in jail. He has suffered tremendously on account of the gospel. He has been beaten. He has been whipped. He has been stoned. All for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's sometimes this, this, this battle that we engage in, that, yeah, there's, there's this spiritual dimension to it where our, where our spirits can, can be become weary and, and we can feel the attacks internally, but then there's sometimes outward manifestations of that battle. And, and Paul and Epaphroditus, they were, they were fellow soldiers in that battle. They, they engaged uh, with one another in this battle, seeking to bring others to faith in Christ. But again, they didn't fight it with physical weapons. Right? They did their battle on their knees in prayer. They, they sought the word of God and taught God's word. And they shared the gospel with others. So they're fellow soldiers for the cause of Christ. So he calls him my brother, fellow worker, my fellow soldier. But he also calls him your messenger. Your messenger, talking to the Philippians, he is the Philippians' messenger. This, this refers to a specific task which the Philippians had sent Epaphroditus to do. Okay, they sent him to be a messenger. They, they had a message that they wanted to send with Epaphroditus to Paul. Of course, Paul is in prison, and so they sent him that way. It's a very, a very important job. It was a critical job. It's, it would have been a very long journey from, from Philippi to Rome to deliver that message. And so they trusted him with that message that he would carry it. To Paul. But it wasn't just a message, but there was also a gift that was given from the Philippians to Paul, and Epaphroditus was the one who was charged to deliver this gift. If you just flip over real quick to chapter 4 of Philippians, we find Paul talking about that. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my need once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So we have Paul there saying that, yeah, Epaphroditus, he came and, and he delivered this gift to me from you. Of course, Paul, he's again, he's in prison. And the Roman prison at, at that time, the Romans did not supply prisoners with things like food water or just even just the basic necessities of life they didn't take care of the prisoners you were in prison if anyone's going to take care of you it's going to come from the outside world my only job as a soldier my only job as someone who's keeping the prison is to make sure you don't get out you can die and rot in that prison for all i care that's that's the way those prisons operated and so the the philippians hear about paul he they, they know he's in prison they know he's he has these physical needs and they want to help so they send epaphroditus to to send a message to paul but then also to deliver a gift, to deliver an offering that the Philippians had collected so that Paul could care, be, be taken care of, so that Paul could have food, so that Paul uh, could have some of the basic necessities of life. So Paul is, is commending Epaphroditus as, as that messenger who is bringing that gift. And then the fifth thing he says, not only is he... My brother, my, so, my fellow soldier, my fellow worker, messenger. He's also minister to my need. Epaphroditus was a minister. Now today we think of minister, we think of clergy, right? We think of someone who's a pastor, someone who is, who is you know, in, in, he, he leads a church or something like that. But, but the word minister literally means servant. That's what minister means. He's a servant. So we could, we could literally translate this as servant. Epaphroditus, he is your servant to my need. He is, he's ministered to me. He has served me in my need. So Epaphroditus was a servant. He was someone that, that sought to serve others. He provided service to Paul. He, he ministered to Paul in this way. 
Well, in the course of this, as, as Paul has sent Epaphroditus to Rome, or as the Philippians sent Epaphroditus to Rome to, to serve Paul and to minister to him in this way, he's really an extension of the ministry of the church in Philippi, some tragedy happened along the way, or some, some hardship happened along the way. So look uh, down in verse 26. It says, Epaphroditus has been longing for you because he has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. So somewhere along the journey, Epaphroditus got sick. And Paul goes on to say uh, in verse uh, 27, indeed he was ill near to death. So Epaphroditus got so sick that he was about to die. That's, that was the, uh, that's the circumstances in which Epaphroditus found himself. He was, he was seeking to, to be a minister. He was seeking to serve. He was seeking to carry this message. And in the midst of that, he got tremendously ill, even to the point of death. And so Paul is eager to send you know, Epaphroditus. He recovers, evidently, and, and he's back to full health. And, and Epaphroditus... Uh, Paul is sending him back to Philippi because he knows, okay, yeah, the Philippian church, now they've heard that Epaphroditus is sick. Now they're concerned about Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus wants the Philippians to know that he's okay. And Paul wants the Philippians to know that Epaphroditus is okay. But not only that, <clears throat> but Paul wants the church to honor this man. Verse 28, I am, I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice seeing him to get again, and that I may be less anxious. Verse 29, so receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. He nearly died for the work of Christ. So as Paul describes this man, he's, he's, he's my brother, my brother in Christ, uh, this man that I, that I love dearly. He's my, my fellow soldiers. We're, we are engaged in warfare for the sake of the gospel of Christ. He's my fellow worker. We, we work alongside one another. We labor alongside one another. He is, he is a messenger carrying this message along, and he's a, a servant, a servant to me. Now Paul sends him back. He says, these are the kind of injury. You need to, to receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. Paul is commending the life of Epaphroditus, commending this man who risked everything for the sake of the gospel. Honor such men. And to me, this, this is just a, a tremendous picture a tremendous real-world example of what it looks like to have the same mind as Jesus Christ. When Paul says, have this mind in you that Jesus also had, who, who humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Well, that's what Epaphroditus did. Epaphroditus was willing, willing to serve, willing to go. He was willing to even risk his life for the sake of serving and loving others. So to me, there's, there's, two, there's, there's two big takeaways. Like what, what could motivate someone to this level of self, selflessness? What could motivate someone to this level to where he was willing to die for the sake of a... What, what could motivate them? And to me, I see great love for others in Epaphroditus. He is, he is, he's a, a minister. He is seeking to minister to Paul. And he nearly died for the sake of Christ seeking to complete what is lacking in the Philippian service. That's not a slight. He says, what is lacking in your service to me? That's, that's not Paul. He's not trying to uh, you know, throw a little shade at the Philippians in that. He's just saying, oh yeah, you, this is something that you wanted to complete, and now Epaphroditus is the one to complete that. So I see great love for others in the life of Epaphroditus as he's seeking to serve others, risking his life. So, so Epaphroditus was motivated to selflessness by his love for others. We also see that Epaphroditus was motivated to selflessness because of the gospel of Christ. He was willing to die. That's what it says in verse 30. He nearly died for the work of Christ. So he's willing to risk his life to serve others, willing to risk his life for the work of Jesus Christ. We have a 
real world example. This is what it looks like. This is what a life lived following after having the same mindset of Jesus Christ. This is what it looks like. So when I read that, I know I'm challenged. I'm, I'm, I'm challenged by this because as I read this, okay, this is, what, this is what Epaphroditus risked for the sake of serving and for the sake of sharing Christ. What am I willing to risk? What am I willing to risk to serve someone else, to love someone else and serve them? What am I willing to risk so that someone else may hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ? That they too may be saved. Am I willing to risk death? I don't know that I'll have to face it. I, I, I don't know. What about other things? Am I willing to risk inconvenience? Am I willing to risk you know, someone scoffing at me or making fun of me or, or, or rejecting me? Am I willing to risk entering into difficult conversations? <laughs> it was the, 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 all the barriers that, that we that tend to prevent us from from serving and, and, and sharing the gospel with others. When you when you compare them with what others individuals have have been willing to risk in in times of past, like people like Epaphroditus, they they really pale in comparison. They really pale in comparison to where it's like <laughs> Epaphroditus was willing to risk his life, and I'm I'm not willing to risk. You know, make make it a fool of myself. I mean, that's that's nothing. Am I willing to be humble? Am I willing to humble myself to the point where, yeah, I, maybe I get rejected? So, <laughs> so you know, it's it's not that big of a deal, but it feels like it. It feels like it to to be and and to risk that. You know, something that um, this past weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, Liz and I or our family, we were up in Remington, Indiana, uh, Midwest Church Extension, that's the organization we're with, um, uh, planting churches. Every other year, they gather all of their personnel together and just, just have a time of fellowship, just some housekeeping within the organization, just, just updates, anything that uh, they'd be helpful for church planters to know as, as we're uh, ministering and and uh, it's just a time of equipping and fellowshipping with one another with all of our uh, church planting family with the MCE family and one of the things that was said that really stuck out to me was this you know once we get to heaven we will be able to do and do better every aspect of our spiritual life than we can do right now every aspect of our spiritual life whether that's prayer, worship, singing songs, the, all, the, you know, all these understanding God's word, all these different aspects of our spiritual life and spiritual disciplines. We'll be able to do all of those and do them way better than we can ever imagine doing them now when we're in heaven. The one thing we will not be able to do is lead another person to saving faith in Jesus Christ. We won't be able to do that there. Because everyone there has received Christ. So if, if we can do every aspect of our spiritual life and do it perfectly in glory, well, why are we still here? Well, it's for that reason. It is for that reason that we would be able to lead others to faith in Christ as well. And so I challenge you, what are you willing to risk? What are you willing to risk for the sake of serving others? What are you willing to risk for the sake of the gospel of Christ, that others may hear the gospel of Christ? And when we're living that way, when we are willing to risk whatever it may be, whether it's, whether it's you know, just an inconvenience or whether it's a, a financial setback or whatever, whatever it might be, what are we willing to risk for the sake of serving others? When we are behaving that way, that is how we are following in the footsteps of Jesus, having the same mind in us that was also in Christ Jesus. So I challenge you with that today. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for uh, Jesus Christ. Thank you for what he accomplished on his death on the cross. 
Thank you for the examples of, of men like Timothy, who did not seek his own interests, but the, sought the interests of others. Thank you for the examples of men like Epaphroditus, who's willing to risk his life for the sake of the gospel, willing to risk his life in order to serve Paul. Lord, help us to be individuals who, who could be described as Epaphroditus, that we, that we could be described as brothers and sisters, that we could be described as fellow workers for the cause of Christ, that we could be described as, as soldiers engaged in spiritual warfare for the sake of Christ. Lord, help us to be your messengers, spreading the gospel of Christ and ministers, servants to one another, that we may love them, serving them. And Lord, use us. Give us a great zeal for the gospel. Help us, Lord, to be confident in sharing the truth of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.